Welcome to the 700 Club Canada. I'm Brian Warren. And I'm Laura Lynn Tyler Thompson. It's great to be with you. Thanks for joining us here on the 700 Club Canada. We have got a great show today, including some amazing stories of life after death. I love these ones. Mm -hmm. And you'll see how a thrill-seeking skydiver got closer to heaven mm -hmm. after his plane fell from the sky. Mm, that's right. It was the ultimate thrill ride that completely changed <laughs> Mickey's life. Yeah, that's I an bet. understatement. He <laughs> yeah. explains in vivid detail his visions of the afterlife while doctors frantically rushed to keep him alive. Mm. You know, uh, one of uh, a pastor that uh, I once really, um, you know, valued the way that he had a great take on life. And it was really interesting. He had been in a plane. Mm. The plane had some bumps and took a, an instant fall, you yeah. know, and scared the whole group, yeah. right? And he had always thought that if you're facing, uh, you know, death, that you would be the kind of person like, Jesus, forgive me of my sins, yeah. help me to be all okay. But he was sitting beside somebody and the amount of curses the that gamer. they let go, yeah. upon <laughs> thinking that they're facing death, he, it said, you know, he said that it changed his perspective of how, you will die as you have lived. Yeah, it, it's funny because when I was playing with the Eskimos uh, and we won the Great Cup in 87, we would fly between Calgary and Edmonton yes. and there's instantly this sink. Right. And those big it's men, bumpy. oh. Whoa, yeah, whoa. It's scary. <laughs> Even for a big guy like you. <laughs> Not like me. And I was kind of like, hey, what's going on, guys? Right, you know, okay. what's, what's You're happening? Good with it. And they're yeah. like, we don't think that's funny because. <laughs> You know, when you find out they're not ready to go. Right. And uh, so it was just the funniest you thing for me. You were ready to go. I though. was ready. Yeah. I said, I know where I'm going. It's right. a whole lot better than Edmonton. Right. But That's so cool. buckle up or grab a parachute. You yeah. won't want to miss this. Take a look. Mm -hmm. The first time you open your parachute, it's pretty amazing. It's so peaceful. The panorama, you're hanging a half a mile above the earth. And so it wasn't about the adrenaline. It was about the pleasure. It was about the pleasure of being in free fall and feeling like you could fly. Mickey Robinson was a professional skydiver. He loved falling from the heavens and drifting safely to earth. But one day, just after takeoff for a practice jump, the plane's engine stalled, hurling Mickey and his companions toward the ground at over 100 miles an hour. The motor just quit, and we had an aerodynamic stall, so there was no hope. He had seconds, and then we impacted. The plane hit the ground and cartwheeled to a stop. With my legs sticking out, what was now a hole inside of the fuselage, and with my hand I was pulling, but something had a hold of my equipment, and I was trapped, and I was soaked with airplane gasoline and on fire from head to toe. His friend fought through the flames and pulled Mickey out. In severe pain and losing consciousness, Mickey asked God for help. For the first time in my life, a man that was totally self-sufficient, I relied on my own natural ability, my own strength. For the first time in my life, I called out to a God I didn't know and never served. I just said, God, please help me. I'm sorry. Give me another chance. At the hospital, it was quickly evident to the doctors that his chances of survival were not good. They didn't think I'd make it through the night. They thought I'd die of shock. I had head trauma, massive lacerations, tremendous burns over my body. I had some internal injuries they didn't really, really know about. My organs were actually shutting down. I had sepsis. That's interior infection all over the inside of your lining your body and my body was fighting a battle that in the natural there was no way it could win i could feel just life leaking out of me at that point i had an experience i had no grid for this at all my inner being my spirit man went perpendicular to my body and i was like immediately ejected and transported and i i all of a sudden was thrust into a spiritual dimension i looked at myself and there was nothing wrong with me this was a real place. And I was also traveling. I, was, I had no control of what was going on. I was like on an upward glide path, and I saw a white portal in the distance, and I felt a piece about emanating from it. So I was heading towards there, and then I felt a pressure like on my right side, just as I was about there, and I looked, and I looked into something I can only describe as blacker, an abyss that was blacker than black. This was eternal. This thing, the more I looked at it, the more it closed to where it was, I was almost by this white portal and it was eclipsing it and I cried out the same clumsy, desperate thing. I'd sit in the, in the ambulance, in the emergency room, on the operating table. I said, no, God, I'm sorry. I want to live. I want to be alive. And as those words gushed out desperately out of my spirit, I was thrust through this white portal and instantly I was standing in the presence of Almighty God and I knew I would never die 
it transcended everything I knew or could imagine about the most great things in the world. It went above and beyond all, anything I could imagine. The love of God is just, it's so pure, it's so perfect, it's so incredible. And I, I didn't see any creatures, I didn't see any angels, I didn't see the pearly gates, Peter checking IDs, and all this stuff and people's concepts, I didn't see any of that. But the glory of God, the, the radiance of God, but mostly God himself and the magnificence of his love, was, the undiluted love of God was being poured into me. There was nothing negative allowed to be in the presence of God. So I was pure and I was innocent. And it's so incredible, the ecstasy, the bliss, the joy, all the stuff we've read about, when you really experience it, we don't have words. We're gonna have to invent new words. <laughs> Despite wanting to stay in heaven, Mickey says he was sent back to his body. My spirit came back from the presence of God, came to the hospital, sank into my body, much like when a person would slip a glove on their hand. And I was so full of life and love. And around the bed was about a half a dozen doctors and nurses. And I had this ability to know what they were experiencing. They just, they just saw me die and come back to life. <laughs> and they were scared of what they saw. And there I am, what was ever left of my face had a silly grin. I was, I was full of joy. I was so happy to be alive. And I had, I had this love. And I didn't know what to call it. But I loved everybody and everything. Mickey says from that day on, he began to see God working miracles in his life. Doctors said he would not be able to walk again due to the nerve damage in his legs. But the nerves regenerated, and after five years of blindness in his right eye, his sight was restored. Part of God's love is his, rest, his ability to restore, and everything that was lost, he's been restoring. And you really appreciate your life when it's restored, and I think any amount of restoration, we need to really thank God for it. And to think that the huge amount of restoration I have, I need to be grateful every day. He wrote a book detailing his experiences called Falling Into Heaven. Mickey says of all the miracles he has been a part of in his life, it is God's love that has meant the most to him. I'm blown away that God loves me. I'm blown away that God took a mess and made a masterpiece out of it, not my masterpiece, his. Mickey has traveled the world proclaiming the love of God and the healing power of Jesus that he has experienced during his second chance at life on earth. There's only one path to God. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. The blind see, the lame walk, the dead are raised. I didn't have leprosy, but I did have pretty bad skin problems. And he binds up the brokenhearted. If we did a forensic study and checked all the fingerprints, it would only add up to Jesus Christ. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Nobody else could do this but Jesus Christ. Wow, what an incredible story. Not anything any of us would want to live through, but what a revelation he had of who God is, about his love, his power, about the fact there is an eternity. You know, uh, Hebrews um, 9 speaks of this, and it actually sort of begins in verse 26. Let me read this to you. It says, But he, speaking of Jesus, has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself, just as people are destined to die once, and after that, to face judgment. So Christ has sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he'll appear a second time, not to bear the sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. I've decided that I am waiting for him, that my eternity is sealed in Christ, that I know where I'm going. I do not fear death. I know that when God decides it's time, it is sealed. I have received Jesus as my Lord and Savior. If you're wondering about your eternity and, uh, and where you're going to spend that, and if you've actually done the due process that the Word of God talks about, that you have received Jesus, you know, He paid such a huge sacrifice so that you could be free, so that you could have eternal life. In, in actual fact, we never die. We never die. Our souls live on forever. If you're wondering about life beyond the grave, we'd sure love to get this into your hands. 1-855-759-0700. Give us a call. It's absolutely free. It'll tell you all about what the Word of God has to say about an eternity. And you know, sometimes we wrestle with this and we think, well, you know, maybe it all just goes to black. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it doesn't. 
The Bible does not say it goes to black. It says we face a judgment. We die once and we face the judgment. So I pray that you'll seal this in your heart today. Coming up next, you'll meet Jordan, who didn't believe in hell until he saw it with his very own eyes. Hello, Canada. We're inviting you to join us for our special week of prayer. April 23rd through the 27th, we are focusing on the power of prayer as we pray for timely issues facing our nation. And we'll also spend time praying for your needs as we believe God answers prayer. If you're a partner and receive the prayer request form in the mail, we encourage you to fill it out and mail it back to us <laughs> so that we can pray for you. We're excited about our powerful week of prayer, April 23rd through the 27th. Don't miss it. It's going to be amazing. I went my whole life not believing that that hell was real. I said, you know, I didn't want to believe in all that dark stuff, you know. I, there's no hell. That's what I thought. But there is a hell. Jordan Samuel believes there's a hell because he believes he's been there. I could hear cackling, like laughing, <laughs> like laughs they were demons. I could hear stuff. Earlier in his life, he never believed hell existed. If I live my life and do the best I can do, like karma-wise, you know, what goes around comes around, I'll just be the best man that I can be. He grew up in Edmonton, British Columbia with a single mom and went to a Catholic school. He was naturally inquisitive and asked a lot of questions about Jesus. How could one man come and just die for me? And, you know, who is this guy? And for that, he was kicked out of class. But my third time getting kicked out of class, I remember saying, you know what? I never want to know this Jesus guy. Whoever he is, he just gets me in trouble, and I just get kicked out of class, and no one wants to give me answers about him, and this is how people treat me. I don't want to know. His mom married, and for the next 15 years, Jordan says his family life was great. Then, his mom and stepdad divorced. Jordan was devastated. The only way he knew how to deal with the pain was to rebel. So whether that was drinking and driving with buddies and underage driving, stealing cars, and, you know, getting stereos and having the thrill of, you know, almost someone catching me, but not quite. For the next four years, Jordan continued his reckless behavior, but he wanted to turn his life around so he stopped selling drugs and started working for an oil rig company. I was making really good money at a really good house. After work one day, Jordan decided to smoke some pot. He didn't know the pipe he used was laced with crack cocaine, something he had never done before. Jordan was sure he was dying. I can feel my heart going boop, 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 slow it down, boop, 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 and then like fluttering. Jordan believes in that moment he went to hell. All these women and all the things you think you want in the world, money, car, success, you know, um, all these things that I had I, and I was driving, I was just loving it. And then all of a sudden this car broke down. All of a sudden these women turned to huge, huge demons and the, it, it, it earthquaked. And I looked behind me and I can hear screaming, it's all red and black. Ah, turn around. Turn around, get out of here. It sounded like people burning, people that were just, just burning that couldn't find a cure or a fix to anything. It was just the worst. And I remember being afraid, gripping the steering wheel. And then all of a sudden it was like, I'm back to my body in the trailer room. As Jordan was taking what he thought was his last breath, he made a declaration of faith to God. And my heart's went, boom. like the last beat. Not even knowing why, I just said, I believe. And all of a sudden, boom, I'm gone. That's when Jordan says Jesus pulled him out of hell and took him to heaven. He was all in white. He was in a robe when I saw him. And he looked at me and he wears a crown on his head. And his eyes are fierce like fire, but there is no like like color, just bright looking at me. And he's just, he's like, just, he just is amazing. You're at his feet, you're at the Lord's feet because he's just perfect. You worship him because he's the almighty. You worship him because he's, 
he's, he saved us. Then Jordan believes he was standing before God. The Lord went to the right hand of the Father, and I began to get judged by the Father. And it was the worst, because what happened was he, he played secrets in my heart that I locked away that I only knew that I ever did. And I thought no one could do, and I could feel what God felt. And I said, Lord, forgive me. Like, it was the worst feeling. And he just comes in, and he hugs you. He says, all is forgiven. My old heart was, was broken. My old heart needed fixing. And God gave me a new heart. All of a sudden, he told me he loved me, that I'm not alone, that I've never been alone. He showed me all the times in my life where I thought I was lucky, that I thought I was alone, but how his hand was always just upon me. And he was always right there pursuing me nonstop. He hugged me again, told me he loved me. And all of a sudden, I was like, Phew. I'm back in my trailer room on the floor. I grabbed the Bible. It was like it was glowing and I held it. Phew. I opened up the Bible. First thing I ever read out of the Bible was Psalms 34. The happiness of those who trust in God. I began to read it and it was everything that just happened to me. Only God can do that. Jordan shared his journey to heaven and hell with his girlfriend, Danica. His voice changed, his eyes changed, his body language changed. Everything about him was new. It was different. So there was no doubting that he had had the experience that he did. My mouth, my words, swearing, everything was like cleansed, like cleansed. I was delivered from any addiction I had. Today, Jordan and Danica are married with two children. They're missionaries preaching the gospel around the world. They're letting everyone know Jesus is real and that he can change the most hardened heart with his love. God loves the broken and loves the lost and he doesn't give up on them. He loves them with all his heart. He leaves the flock to find the one, and he did. Jordan and Danica are a beautiful couple, and uh, that was quite an experience that Jordan had as well, because he said instantly, my language changed, everything changed. And it was because of the hissing that he heard and the, the smell and everything, the vividness of hell. Do you realize in the Bible, it, it mentions heaven over 622 times, but it only mentions hell 54 times? It mentions heaven in 54 books of the Bible. It literally says that it's a strange thing when a person goes to hell. It's not what God intends, because the Bible makes it very clear that he desires that none should perish, but all would come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I believe today that God has got your attention and you're locked in on this station for a reason. I don't believe that there is any coincidence, but I believe there's a divine incident. And your birth is the identification that God called you on this earth for such a time of this to do something. But today, I wonder if you're ready. If you would leave out your door and you would go into your car, are you ready if eternity called you today? If you're not, you don't have to be afraid of what's happening on the other side because Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Now that's the guarantee. And the Bible makes it very clear. If you believe in your heart that he is who he said he is and you confess it with your mouth because it's what the heart one believes unto salvation, it's what the mouth one confesses unto salvation, the heart one believes, you will be saved. He wants you to be saved today. And I want to lead you in a prayer, and I want to get something into your hands, and it costs you absolutely nothing. Pray this prayer with me. Jesus, I surrender. I confess my sin. I want heaven to be my home. Be the Lord and Savior of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, today's your birthday. Call the number on the screen, 1-855-759-0700. Prayer partners are standing by. And remember, heaven is your home. Coming up next, author and teacher Joy Amaral is here with a biblical perspective on the afterlife. You don't want to miss it. I got a phone call that Zach had been in an accident. He had some of the deepest electrical injuries I had ever seen. The doctor told us he's not going to make it. And we were saying, come on, Zach, come back to us, Zach. And that's like the minute the prayer started. See miraculous stories like this in Answered Prayer. 
Pat Robertson's latest teaching uncovers the keys to help you get results, break down barriers, and build dynamic faith to receive your answered prayer. Available now. Sometimes in the West, we think we have it all figured out. You know, we come to the Bible with our Western perspective and mindset, and we fail to take the Bible at its cultural value. And instead of allowing the culture of the Bible to speak to us, we try to take our culture and kind of force it onto the Bible. I want to give you an example of this as we come into this, uh, the Feast of Trumpets, the, the High Holy Days, the most sacred time in the biblical calendar. And today it's called Rosh Hashanah, head of the year. It's the first day of the civil calendar. But in the times of the Bible, it was simply called the Feast of Trumpets. And there were some traditions that were associated with the Feast of Trumpets that gets picked up on later by the Apostle Paul and some of the others. And a lot of times we think that Paul and Peter and James are given us Christian theology. You have to understand Christianity did not yet exist. These guys were Jews, they were preaching to Jews, and it was Jewish theology that later became accepted by the church and became what we would call Christian. Let me give you an example of this as we talk about this, the Feast of Trumpets. There was a belief system in place at, at that time, at the Second Temple when Jesus lived, and it was this, that on one day on the Feast of Trumpets, which is the first day of the month Tishri, the seventh month in the biblical calendar, that a great trumpet would sound, and that all those who were faithful, all those who followed God, when they heard that trumpet sound, listen to this, that they would be raised to life, and if they were alive, they would be raised before the presence of God, and there they would have to stand before Him and give an account of their actions. Now, I know what you're thinking, hey, that sounds really familiar, that's in the Bible. Yes, it's in the Bible, but it didn't come from a Christian background. This was already in Jewish theology. This idea of a trumpet being connected to the raising of the dead became so popular that you can even see in cemeteries, in Jewish cemeteries, instead of a Star of David or um, Hebraic writing, you'll see there a shofar to remind them that one day there will be a great trumpet call and all those who hear that call are gonna be raised to life, are gonna stand before God to give an account for their actions. I mean, guys, look in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 51 and 52. This is what Paul is saying there. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump or at the last shofar. For the shofar shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. And so here's one of these prime examples in the New Testament of how Jewish theology became the basis for what we as Christians believe today. We need to understand, guys, that we are the ones who have the privilege of being grafted in to the olive tree. And if you know how a tree works, the, the, the stump or the trunk doesn't need the branches to survive, but the branches need the trunk. They need the tree to survive. And we've been grafted into that olive tree. So what that means is as we're grafted in, we're being nourished from those Hebraic roots. The more we study the past, the more we study about what life was like in the time of Jesus, the more we learn about his culture, the more we learn about him. And the more we learn about him, the more we can become like him. And that's why we're here today. We're not here to take you back into the Old Testament. We're not here to take you back into the old times but we're simply here to present to you the richness and all the beauty that the Hebraic roots have to offer us. And, and the closer and deeper we get into our roots, the more we become connected to the biblical Jesus. I'm Joe Amaral.
You know, we want to recognize one of our amazing partner ministries, Windsor Life Center in Windsor, Ontario. I have personally been there and met some of those great ladies who are overcoming incredible odds to get their life back on track. When you partner with the 700 Club Canada, your support helps the work that the Windsor Life Center is doing to help women overcome drug and alcohol addiction. Call the number on the screen and consider joining with us today for just $20 a month. We'll send you this DVD called Answered Prayer as a way to thank you and to bless your life. Thank you for helping transform the, and restore the life of daughters, sisters, and mothers. You know, we uh, have a great uh, gift for you today, and that is we want to agree with you today specifically for breakthrough in areas of recovery. Mm -hmm. I believe that God has a, right after uh, Easter, we recognize that the power of God, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is able to break every chain. And so we want to pray for you today, but we also would like you to put on your prayer list, John from Edmonton and he's praying for his Cecilia after a heart attack. Mm, and also Anne from Richmond, relief from attacks of the darkness. We know that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Absolutely. Let's Amen. touch and agree. Father, we just thank you, Lord. I bring Anne before you. I pray, Father, that every curse of the enemy over her life be broken. Yeah. Everything that is generational, oh God, e every door that has been opened to enemy attack be shut yeah. by the blood and the power of Jesus', Jesus name. name. I pray for relief and peace in her life. Yeah, and Father, we agree with John. We blend faith together for his Cecilia after that heart attack. And we pray that there would be no... Lord, residual effects of that heart attack, but you would cause her to be in perfect peace and her mind stayed on Jesus. And we ask now for resurrection power for our 700 Club Canada family and our, our friends, God. We ask that you would cause now their spirits to rise in the joy of the Lord, which is their strength, to be theirs now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We want to leave you with this power verse. It says, the Lord will rescue me from every evil attack mm -hmm. and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. That's in 2 Timothy 4.18. Until next time. God bless. To contact us, phone 1-855-759-0700. You can email us at cba at 700club.ca. You can now like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter or Instagram. Tomorrow on the 700 Club Canada. I instantly fell to my knees in front of him. And I knew that I was falling in the presence of God. Crystal McVeigh wasn't having a dream. She had died and says she woke up in heaven.